our panel for tonight includes inspiring women from around the globe. They will be sharing their experience as ex-Muslims, their stories, and the great work they do. Um, I'll be introducing them as they come up the stage. Iktisan Betty. Um, she's a clinical psychologist specializing in criminology and victimology, particularly violence against women. She's the co-founder of Alternative Movement for Individual Liberties and have organized a number of civil disobedience events in Morocco. Minzy Bates, or Marwa, She's an ex-Muslim YouTuber who discusses issues that Muslims and non-Muslims face. She's part of the movement to normalize ex-Muslims and put an end to blasphemy and apostasy, apostasy scrutiny in Muslim communities. She went to a Muslim school in London and has been to a number of um, religious Muslim um, events and organizations before she came out two years ago. Zara Kay. <coughs> Uh, Zara Kay is a Tanzanian ex-Muslim and atheist activist. She's based in Amsterdam. Um, she was both as a Shia Muslim in Tanzania. She's the founder of Faceless Hijabi, a platform to celebrate ex-Muslim women, to share their stories and get support. And just to correct that, it's Australia. Is it? <laughs> Sally is a co spokesperson of CMB. She's a human rights activist with a focus on um, honor based violence, forced marriage, and sexual violence. Uh, she was featured in the award winning film Islam Believers in 2016, and she's the winner of the IKWRO Special Recognition Activist in 2017. This Will be, will be chaired by Mari Namazi, who's the founder and cosco person for the Council of Justice Muslim. <laughs> and we'll welcome all. Um, um, Halima Salad is also another member who should have been with us today, but the Home Office didn't grant her visa. Boo! Yeah, but she, she will join us later by the year, so we'll see her later. Discussion. Um, just a few questions about our backgrounds. I mean, we've got some very incredible, interesting women here. I'm really so proud to be sitting uh, amongst them. And it would be nice just to, we thought just to have a chat uh, about some of the things, uh, you know, our backgrounds, when we started doubting, what are some of the uh, problems we faced, uh, what, are, what are the greatest. Uh, things that have happened as a result of our questioning and doubting. And then we will open it up to you in the last uh, 20, 25 minutes. Um, so, so be patient, we'll, we'll come back to you. So I want to just start maybe with Marwa. Now, uh, Marwa is uh, Mimsy Vids. She's, uh, she's an amazing YouTuber, if you've seen her. Uh, I, I don't usually like to mention one's husband alongside one. Uh, but, but her husband is also amazing, and he's uh, we do this, and he does some brilliant uh, videos as well. And what's interesting about Marwa, actually, um, when I was looking at her work, um, I realized that she started looking more deeply into Islam because she wanted her to persuade her father not to be an ex-Muslim. And her father is another amazing man, Hassan Radwan, who was one of our early members uh, as well. So I found that quite interesting. You know, here she is wanting to challenge her dad, show him how wrong he is, and then she ends up uh, becoming worse than him. <laughs> so, so tell us about that, because that's quite an interesting background, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, no. Oh. No, that's only for YouTube. Um, is this working? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's basically it. So I was very, very devout as a Muslim. I think I was probably even, like, stricter than my dad ever was anyway. Um, and that's because I had a, you know, I was raised in a Muslim school, as you said, and 
the people I was around were a lot more kind of Salafi based, which is just kind of hardcore, you know, music is haram, everything's haram basically, uh, nothing was allowed. Um, so I, yeah, I, I was kind of very much influenced by that and I felt like that was the real Islam. And, even when my dad was Muslim, I kind of felt like he wasn't a great Muslim. Um, so it was almost like I never, <laughs> this is so bad, I feel like I'm bashing him, but I never like took his kind of opinion, like, you know, I didn't hold it in the highest esteem anyway. Um, because, I, you know, I went to this Muslim school and my chefs were telling me, this is Islam. Um, so I was always giving my dad like dawa and like trying to tell him like, actually, this is how it's supposed to be. Um, and then when he kind of sat me down and was like, so I don't believe in Islam anymore, um, but you can do what you like, that's kind of what he said to me. I was kind of like, okay, so he's having a mental breakdown. Um, <laughs> this is what this must be because this is ridiculous. Um, it's, like, it's like telling someone the truth isn't the truth. It's like there's, there was no way of that not being, like there was no way that Islam wasn't true. Um, in my mind. So I was like, okay, you live your life and I'll just pray for you and also I will um, be stronger in my in my Islam and be a stronger Muslim, not just for him, but also for myself. I wanted to, um, you know, and a part of it also was I like genuinely loved people and I felt like I actually don't want everyone to go to hell. Um, like it would be nice if we all went to heaven, right? So I kind of wanted to kind of spread the word and then just bring everyone along with me. So I had that in my mind of just, I'll be a strong Muslim. So I really kind of delved deep. And um, when I was at university, I would make leaflets. Um, so I was like one of those pushy religious people. So <laughs> I would like, you know, and I would kind of swoop it into any conversation, you know, like, oh, well, Islam says, you know, whatever. It's like, even if we're talking about like health, I'd be like, well, you know, the problem of Muhammad. <laughs> So it was, you know, I and it's, and as I said, it came from a place of I cared about people, and I and I didn't want to think about the bad things. I didn't want to think like, oh, by the way, everyone's going to be tortured if they don't. So I was like, okay, let's just stop thinking about that and focus on the good. Focus on the good, um, and yeah. And then eventually, it was kind of like I was battling with myself over many years of trying to cope with the concept of, um, well, women are just meant to be subservient to men, you know, and that's the way God made us. And, you know, trying to kind of accept things like that, obviously in our day and age, it becomes, you know, a little difficult. And even with, with science and with all the things that kind of kept coming up. And I think the reason I was fighting with these as well is because I was trying to convert people that were giving me other arguments. And then I would be like, okay, give me one second, I'm just gonna come right back and I'm just gonna do loads of research and then we'll discuss this again. So I kept kind of running away, doing all the research and then being like, oh crap, I don't have any answer for you. Like, there's, I don't know what to tell you. Um, yeah. And it's interesting because uh, you were saying that you actually had uh, people do an intervention recently when you went home yeah. and uh, they were trying to uh, bring the sheikh and exercise her or whatever they did to you. So yeah. maybe talk about being on the receiving end of that as well and what happened there. Well, yeah, so I, I absolutely am on the receiving end of that like all the time now. Um, it's like a constant thing with, um, with my family. Some family have just cut me off. Others are kind of like, um, you know, just telling me about the horrible things about hellfire and and you know, my, my grandmother actually, this is just, I'll come to that in a second, my grandmother just died um, recently and all my family felt like this is a reason to tell me like you're gonna die soon and you're gonna go to hell. And it was like the most horrible situation to be in. So I'm like, I seriously don't wanna hear this right now. And it's like literally you're kind of, you know, experiencing this and it's like they find a reason to scare you. And it's like this fear factor of like, do you see that? That's gonna be you, that's gonna be you. Okay, do you really wanna go through that? And like, you know, and then you're gonna to be tortured in the grave. Um, and it's like, oh, this is not the time or place. But yeah, I did have an intervention recently um, where I kind of, you know, went to meet my family and uh, a bunch of them basically had planned for a chef to come and have a conversation with me and 
basically solve all my problems and bring me back to Islam, I think was the plan. Um, and, uh, you know, he kind of just explained, will try to have a debate with me and explain why it's okay for men to hit women because it's only with a feather and it's, you know, it's just, it's just a light thing. It's, you know, all these, you know, and we were going, we were going at it for a good, like, two to three hours. Um, and um, it was exhausting and we were going around in circles, but the conclusion was I had magic on me um, and I needed to be exercised, you know, as you were saying, and, uh, you know, he was trying to kind of tell me that I needed to take kind of chronic herbs and things like that and, yeah, it's just, you, you can't argue against them almost because it's like, they're just in this like delusional world. It's like, even when you're trying to argue logic, then it's like, oh, well, it's magic. <laughs> and uh, we'll come back and, and also start feeling free to uh, jump in as well, but I thought I'll ask each of you something and then, uh, well, I guess Betsy, uh, is her, her story is very different, isn't it? Because you come from a quite free thinking family uh, but your um, all the threats and pressures from the external society. Uh, she's very um, active in Morocco, of course, uh, at the forefront of really radical direct action uh, work. Uh, you know, on the ISIS death list. I mean, you name it. Uh, uh, she's had a lot of pressure everywhere. Um, tell us a bit about that background. Growing up in a family that was accepting, but a larger society that wasn't. Okay, so sorry for my English. <laughs> I have a bad English, but I, I, I will try to speak in English and to explain something. Um, yeah, so I, I was born in Morocco, I grew up in Morocco, and now I live in Morocco and France. Um, so yeah, my family, like my family is a sec secular family. My father um, actually died in 2008, but he was activist and he was agnostic. My mother is Muslim, but very secular, so no problem with the religion things. And we didn't, my sister and I, we didn't uh, have um, a religious education. Um, yeah, and my father didn't want us to have a religious education because in Morocco, um, as you know, um, Islam is um, st uh, religion of the states, so public school, so you, you have a re religion education, etc. So my, f my father chose to, uh, to um, put us in a French, international French school because it's secular. Um, but um, with the society and the um, the, the, the big family, like um, uncle, aunts, etc. It was difficult, but it was in the 80s, so it was pretty okay. Uh, but in the 90s and since like, I don't know, 20 years now, uh, we have a lot of problems because of Islamism. So because of my activism, it's okay with my mom, because as I told my, my father died, it's okay with my mom, and um, she supports me a lot, and she supports my activism, my artism, etc. But with neighbors or family in general, or society, and because of my um, activism on social media and a lot of that, um, there is a lot of pressure. So it's very complicated because, as, as you say, it's okay. So a lot of people told me like, okay, but your mom is cool and, and it's cool with your family. And, but yeah, but there is a society. So as a woman, it's very complicated because I'm like, I'm like, I, 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 don't, I don't have like uh, borders. Like, uh, and uh, I, I organize a lot of um, campaigns and demonstration and actions with civil disobedience. And I'm like the first woman I, I, I say in Morocco, in the media, etc. that I'm atheist. So that's complicated because family is one thing and I know that it's very um, hard when your family is um, Muslim or against your belief, etc. But it's, it's not easy because I do live in Morocco. And um, I feel like alone because there is a lot of atheist people in Morocco or agnostic or whatever, but 
it's social hypocrisy. It's like national sport in Morocco. <laughs> so, like, uh, there is lots of um, human rights organizations or feminist organizations, but they told people like me, and they, they, they tell me that I have to hide um, my atheism and uh, some um, thoughts, etc. Um, for example, um, in Morocco, because I'm feminist as well, when we fight for women's rights, I am like universalist and secular uh, feminist. But other feminists in Morocco, they use um, uh, cultural relativism and religion to um, fight for women's rights. So it's very complicated. So I'm actually, I'm very isolated uh, with, the, with the, the other activists because I co-founded a movement. Uh, and it's a secular movement, universal and secular. So we cannot fight and we are never like invited to debate or, um, or I don't know, in the conferences, in the television or whatever. So, uh, but as you say that I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I, have, I have a lot of uh, threats, like rap threats and death threats. But um, I really do not care, <laughs> so because I, I'm not afraid. Uh, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm still fighting against fundamentalists and against uh, uh, Islamism and uh, and uh, some ideologies like obscurantism, etc. So um, what I have to say to to, to finish uh, what I'm saying is, I hope that a lot of people like ex-Muslims uh, could um, show her faces and tell to people that, yeah, we do exist and we do have right to exist. But I can understand as well that it's very complicated uh, because you have a lot of, um, you can have a lot of uh, problem and consequences in, in Morocco as well because a lot of people tell me that like Morocco is very um, open country and it's like uh, moderate Islam, but uh, moderate Islam, what it is, it doesn't it exist. I know Islam and the, the, the laws and the, the Sharia, so, but I, I hope that uh, we can have a lot of people like us to, to, be, to be with us and to stand with us. Thank you. So I, I think you raised... Uh, yes. I'm sorry for my English, it's very complicated. Uh, I, you know, Betsy raises some really important points. One is about how it was even better in, in a way in the 80s and again we're seeing uh, the effects of the rise of Islamism and the religious law right in all of our societies and also uh, the issue of hypocrisy, you know, that people will are okay if you do it privately but the minute you want to do it publicly it's, it's considered, uh, you know, a, a, another form of extremism. I think we hear that quite often and we'll come back to that. Um, but let me come to you, Zara, because uh, Zara is uh, a Tanzanian and she uh, has started something called Faithless Hijabi. And what's interesting is all your sisters are still hijabi, aren't they? All her sisters are still hijabi. And uh, so tell us a bit about that journey of yours. Because so, you left, uh, you, you went independent very early on. Yes. So I was born, does this work? Okay, cool. I was born in Tanzania. Um, I left Tanzania when I was 16. I went overseas for university. Went to Malaysia and then I moved to Australia and I'd been in Australia for about seven, over seven years and I just relocated to London for a short while. Um, I thought London was very exciting with ex-Muslims and Muslims. I think I can learn a lot from this badass women sitting right next to me. I'm so proud. <laughs> um, yeah, so I grew up in a very tight-knit community in the Shia sect. We were called the Koja Shia Ethnashari Jamaat. And Basically, in Tanzania, everybody knew my dad. My last name was, is so unique that if you Google it, it's basically my family and very few second or third cousins. But a lot of people knew my dad and I had started questioning religion when I was 14. I stopped praying, I kind of fasted. There were times, especially living overseas, I was like, nobody's parenting me, I don't really need to fast. I still had my dad call me every day, he's like, did you pray? And I'm like, no. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, so when I started questioning at 14, I stopped praying, I hated it. It just did make sense for me to pray to a God who's given me this life apparently, but he's so selfish that I need to keep praying to him. Um, and when I lived overseas, I, it was the first time at 16 that I encountered a woman who called herself a Muslim and didn't wear a headscarf. I used to, I started wearing a hijab when I was eight. I'd never seen somebody who called himself a Muslim and wore a headscarf. And that was so surprising and it made me realize that I've been in a bubble for 16 years and nobody told me this exists. And slowly I started resenting that I was wearing a headscarf, so I started loosening it up. Um, and at the, age eight, at the age of 18 and a half, I took it off. It would still be around my neck, but I felt so naked. And when I, when I moved to Australia, around 19 years old, um, that's when I publicly, like, you know, posted a photo of me not wearing a hijab. And I told my family, and my dad said, that is equivalent of you being naked. And I know that never came from a malicious intent, but it was, he was conditioned to believe that women need to Muslim women need to be respected in their diamonds and I was treated like an object, as though I was only my father's property or my husband's property. I just felt like an object and there was no Zara. Who is Zara? Like, the, it didn't exist. I was just someone's daughter or to be somebody's wife. And that's what drove me to finish both degrees, my master's at 21. And I started working and I got a job at Google in a very big tech company. I was so proud and I called my dad, I'm like, hey, I got a job at Google. And he's like, so are you gonna start wearing a headscarf now? Because you have a good job? That was, <laughs> at that point is when I realized that I had become from suddenly the golden child because my family had never been to university. I have older siblings that had never done degrees. And suddenly from being a golden child, I went to being a black sheep. And that I had no value or I was never the best daughter because I don't wear a headscarf. And it was in the early months of 2017 when I lost my niece, she was four. And that was devastating for all of us. But as a family, we got together, closer and tighter as a unit. And mid-2017, I posted up my first public post about supporting people who are Muslims and gay, and that they have a right to live and they don't deserve to be like they don't deserve to be criticized and they don't deserve to be ostracized. Um, I, at that point when I posted it up, I was really scared. I didn't know how that post would go and to, and to my surprise, it, in two days I got 500 comments. Most of it was hateful. Um, my dad who hadn't spoken to me for months called me and asked me to take it down. I said, no, this is principle. Whether or not you believe that gay people are right or wrong, I am not letting anybody talk ill about them and I will fight against this. And that's when my dad hung up on me and said, we're done. Like, okay, cool, we're done. But while I was reading through the comments, people just th started throwing verses of the Quran on how they need to be thrown off the, like, you know, they need to be burned or like, you know, the story of Lut, the city of Lut. And that all happened and people were so aggressive. So I went online and I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna prove you wrong that Islam is tolerant and I am going to show it to you. I went online and I looked up for verses that talked about disbelievers, that talked about people who don't agree with you. I'm like, surely there's one that says we're all peaceful and we're amazing and we should be accepting. I started crying when I saw the results. And that's when I knew that this is it. Like, even though I hadn't prayed, this is it. There is no going back that this is the time when I've given up on Islam. And once I gave up on Islam, I, God didn't exist. The only reason I thought God existed was because, you know, I was conditioned to believe it. And that's, I learned more about Islam after leaving it than I had ever learned when I was in it because nobody had ever told me that it was spread by the sword. Nobody had ever told me about the violent verses. I didn't even know 434 was a thing. Uh, 434 is, by the way, the wife beating verse. And I didn't know that existed. I was in the illusion that, you know, Islam is perfect, it's peaceful, I am so blessed to be born as a Muslim, and I'm gonna go to heaven even though I commit sins. But I could never be in a religion that was so hateful towards people's orientation, towards people's faith, and even towards women. And being a woman in tech, I mean a man's world, and then being a woman in Islam, I was already so subjugated. So I think 
When I publicly came out in September 2018, I had decided that I'm going to open an organization that only, not only, but like that is aimed at supporting women who come out because there's a woman in tech. Thank you. So, Faithless Ajabi, what it does right now, and I can go into depth later, but what it does is it creates a safe space for women to share stories anonymously because we're the most oppressed, we're the minority of the minority, and we're not being heard. Every time we put up a dialogue, we're shut down through sexual harassment. And I'm sure all of us can agree that it hasn't been an easy journey, and it's even worse when you're a woman. So Faithless Ujabi started as a little Facebook group because I wanted to help other women and I wanted them to share their stories and every time I read it, while people came, while the girls came from different backgrounds, there was an overlapping story. There was abuse, there was subjugation, there was forced hijab, there was um, assault right after leaving, it was violent. Like, we were treated lower than second class citizens, especially for leaving our faith. And that we had no rights. And Faithless Ajabi now is growing and getting bigger. It's a global movement. People come and they share their stories. I've had curious Muslim share their stories as well. It's that phase in between that they've started questioning. But the, most, the biggest achievement was two days ago when I was being blamed for the Christchurch event. And I think we'll talk about it later. When people called me a murderer and people called me an Islamophobe and a racist. I'm a brown woman. I don't know how I'm racist, but um, people called me names and all of us had, you know, we got messages, are you happy now? Is this what you wanted? But I posted it up online because some people thought they had the right to write a private message to me and ask me to commit suicide because I'm a hateful person. So I posted it up online and a few people from Tanzania came out to me and I was so proud that they, they had never known that, you know, in Tanzania they had never known anybody from the community ever come out public. And a lot of people like in the, since Christchurch came out to me, but that also opened me up to more criticism. I think, I mean, those are such important points and we will come back to that because those are accusations I think all ex-Muslims face. And there's a huge distinction between the right to blasphemy and white nationalism or, you know, white supremacy. Um, but coming back, I mean, I think also Zara's case is really, uh, it shows the importance of financial independence. I think that's something we all always see where people are financially independent. The, the opportunities are a lot, uh, a lot there. Uh, but she also mentioned something about family and I think uh, we all have it to some extent. You've had this as well where, you know, this battle of uh, wanting your family's love even though they are abusive. Um, we actually see that uh, quite often, like... Um, mm. Our ex-Muslims, wow, that was really loud. Um, uh, our ex-Muslims, they love their families, their parents so much, and they're not getting that same love back. And I find that deeply, deeply... It's, it's really sad, because... Tell us about yourself. <laughs> that's the hard part, isn't it? That's the hard part. So, I mean... Um, uh, it, like, this is really... Sometimes it gets really loud, sometimes it gets really quiet. No, it's cool. Um, is that working? Yeah, just, okay, okay, sorry. Um, so, uh, I've been questioning for years, I guess, as a kid. I used to ask my parents just random questions, you know. Uh, you know, I have mummy and daddy, so that's how I, I came to be. Uh, and uh, when I get married, I'll have babies. Um, because I thought that's just how it worked, you know. Um, and there was never any answers for me when I asked them about God's mummy and daddy and God's children. I used to get told that there was something wrong with me, that I had the devil inside me, that I was possessed. But ultimately, actually, when I left religion for the first time, when I left Islam for the first time, I was 15 years old, uh, and to be quite honest, I was just bored by it praying five times a day, reading the same book over and over and over again. I mean, I have this library in my house, right, um, of so many books. I'm, sh I'm guilty of having far more books than I've actually read. I hope to read all of them at some point, uh, but I'm making up for lost time. 
uh, book before. It was just about reading the same book over and over and again. And I actually feel a little bit aggrieved by that because I could have I could have read so much, so many other books in the time that I spent reading the same same literature again and again. Um, so at 15, when I told my mum that I wanted to leave Islam for the first time, I, I didn't phrase it like that. I just said, I don't believe in God. Um, and she turned to me and she said, uh, don't tell anyone else, because we kind of got to kill you if that happens. <laughs> so I was like, OK. Um, so I then just lived quietly for many years. Um, and then when I was 19, I was in an arranged engagement. Um, and because of that engagement, I knew I had to become religious, um, which I did. Uh, so it was just on the crux of my 19th birthday, so I never know if it was 18 or 19. Um, but on my 19th, uh, for, for about six months this engagement lasted, I, I got engaged and I researched lots about the, the duty of a wife, a mother, and various capacities as a woman in Islam. And I kind of didn't like what I was reading. Um, and actually, it wasn't just the Quran that I read. Uh, I read lots and lots and lots of books about the same parts of the Quran, um, because obviously that's the charge that often gets thrown in our face, you know, that you're illiterate, you, you haven't found the right interpretation yet. With whatever way I looked at it, it was just domestic abuse. And actually, as a 19-year-old kid, because that's all you are at 19, even though we think we're like really, really old at that age, um, as a 19-year-old kid, uh, my first thought, actually, wasn't, why does he get to beat me, was, why don't I get to beat him back? Because <laughs> I did want to, I, I, you know, I wanted it to be fair. He gets to kick the shit out of me, I get to kick the shit out of him, you know. <laughs> it's a two-way thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, I kind of questioned that quite a lot, and I got told various interpretations, you know, uh, you can beat them with a feather, you can beat them with a toothbrush, you can beat them with a fucking handkerchief. You can, or, or the best one I ever heard was, you can just humiliate them. It's about humiliating them back into submission. And those, there were a few key words in that, right? So my professional background before CEMB was domestic abuse and sexual violence. So there is, it's nothing other than domestic abuse if you are humiliating somebody. If you have given one person a higher status than the other in a relationship, that is an abusive relationship, and that has no place in, in 2019, in modern day life. You know, we have come to learn now that that's not right. I would like to say that this country hasn't, you know, learned from its mistakes. We used, to, we used to give guidances around what hours we could beat our wives within in this country. It was only in 2000 and, uh, no, not, uh, 1991 that rape within a marriage became a criminal offence in this country. Um, but we, we have these, we kind of tiptoe around these issues when it comes to Islam in Britain, and that's what I find particularly offensive. Um, but what I said, what, something I said earlier, I just want to touch on again, quite often, as ex-Muslims, um, and I don't actually, I don't think it's, I think it's an important label in some ways, but actually it's not my, the most important label for me. I call myself an anti-theist, I don't like religion, and an atheist. But the ex-Muslim uh, title is important for our activism and for, for what it means. Uh, but we need a broader term for all of us, and I think that's why Atheist Day has been so crucial. But often we're asked about, well, what, why did you leave? You know, what, were you abused? Or, uh, you know, we want, we're expected to give some philosophical answer. Nobody ever asks uh, an ex-Christian for the same philosophical answers. Nah, didn't fancy it. That's good enough. Well, why is that not good enough for me? Why do I have to give some fucking philosophical answer? Although I do get that post-leaving religion, a lot of people do a lot of research. Sometimes before leaving religion, they do a lot of research. But why can't we just get to a place where, ah, it was crap. <laughs> I suppose uh, we've, we've talked about when uh, you started doubting. Um, you, your, your time of doubt was when you had that arranged marriage? Was that when? No, so I started really young. I started really, really the young. The second time? The happened? second time it was because 
I, so I, I went into it because I knew, before even starting doing, doing any of my reading, that if I wasn't devout enough, that that relationship would have turned abusive. I mean, I had a bit of history. I'd run away from home, had a boyfriend that was white, and that was, you know, quite controversial. So I had to do a little bit of reshaping of my personality, because otherwise that would have led to quite a lot of abuse. Um, but the second time was, I've forgotten the question. <laughs> <laughs> like the doubt, what, it was when you started reading to prepare for your yeah. wedding, your marriage. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I didn't want to be raped, I didn't want to be you know, beaten. And the fact that he was given that, um, gifted that right by God, that was quite concerning. And what about you, Betty? When was the time when you felt doubt the first time? I think, um, always. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I was very young, but um, because my first blasphemy, I was uh, like five or six years old, because we say Allahu Akbar, in English it's like, God is great. Is great. And I say Allahu Asghar, how to... God, God is small. Or, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and after that, I think I was like 13 or 14 years old because I didn't want to go to um, family thing, family religious thing like Aid and everything. So I refused. But the most important that when I was, so I think I've never been Muslim actually. But I didn't, I didn't care. But when I was, but Islam is there because it's my family, it's society, it's Morocco, blah, blah, blah. But when I was 20, I was in Paris to study. And I had a cancer, and because it's a very important thing, it's a hard thing. So, um, so I don't know why, but you have the the religion thing, the religious things in in the face, and so it was my first really really that. So I I've never been in a in a mosque. Uh, I lived in Morocco, but uh, because I didn't care, but. In Paris, when I had my first chemo, I said, "Okay, so I'm like I'm gonna I'm gonna see. I don't know. It was very weird actually. Like I I asked like for the first time. I want I wanted to know if God or Allah exists. So I went to the mosque after my first chemo. So it was the first time." Um, and after that, so I knew, not, not the moment after my, my chemo, after my, like six months after, um, I, yeah, I knew that it's like, it, it was like a, a break, a definite break with, with Islam or with religion. And so that was very, it was a very, it, yeah, it was the, the first, the, the last thing when I, a doubt, and after that, like uh, I knew that I'm atheist or ex-Muslim, if you prefer. What about uh, uh, regrets? Because I mean, it is a very difficult thing. There's a lot of pressure, and I know that there are ex-Muslims amongst us who become Muslims again, like your dad, for example. Or you know, there is this constant pressure uh, to go back. Um, we have, uh, for example, um, a wonderful ex-Muslim woman who was sent to Sudan by her family. Uh, she was going to be forcibly married. Uh, we managed to bring her back here. Uh, and all of this happened to her because she was an atheist. And we've just, she just told us that she's become a Muslim because she just needs her family and she can't be without them. And I think that's very key, this need for appreciation and your, the love of your family, uh, but also that there is all this pressure that kind of pulls you back. But this is why we say that the, that the love of our families and our communities is conditional. And that's a really, really sad thing, that you have to give up your true self, um, to use that cliche sort of term, um, to get that love and uh, that's something that should be unconditional from your parents. You know, parents, choose to have you, so they should act like parents. Uh, and often we see, um, you know, abusive generation after abusive generation, and often that ends up becoming an excuse from our communities, you know, 
my mum and dad did it to me, and I was an abused child. Well, so fucking what? It's time to get over it for the sake of your kids. Because, of course, I feel sorry for them until a point. But then the fact that they're then choosing to abuse their future generations, that is an active choice that they're making. You decide whether your past becomes your future. And with our communities, they're choosing that. They're choosing to continue to allow to allow that control and coer coercive and controlling behavior to continue from their families and their communities. And they could just say, you know, actually, I'm gonna put my kids first for a change. I suppose, I mean, this is a question that we kind of know the answer, but you wonder, you know, with all the pressures, do you have any regrets, Marwa, any at all? I mean, I, I don't regret leaving Assam or being in this position, but it's it's still a difficult decision. And you know, you mentioned my dad kind of maybe coming back in a way because he wanted the title of Muslim, and I think that is because the way that we were as a family and as a community was we were extremely community and people orientated, and I think that's why I was able to even be so religious without my dad in a way. Um, and you know, we kind of did everything as a community. It's not just a religion, it's not just a belief system, it's your like life, it's the people around you, it's every day, it's just a constant thing, it's your culture. It becomes, you know, it becomes, you, it's just one thing, your family, and as you said, it's, it's conditional, and it's expected. There's no like, well, what do you believe? It's, we are Muslim, um, you know, this is who we are. It's not what we believe. Um, so, so what was the original question? Sorry. Oh, um, so, um, so it, I don't regret it, but it's it's that's been the most painful thing for me. So, you know, and with my dad, um, my whole family were like, you can't speak to him anymore, um, and it's definitely a kind of like you have to cut off ties. Um, you know, I had a few family just not talk to me at all. A few were like, come over to my house. And then they said, actually, we can't host you in our house. Let's meet in a coffee shop. Um, and then they were like, yeah, we've just done this to tell you we can't see you anymore and we can't speak to you anymore. So for someone that is literally, you know, these people were my life. You know, I, I'm not, I wasn't the kind of person, and neither was my dad, that we were very kind of individualistic person. People, we were very... You know, people depended on us and we depended on people. That's just kind of our lifestyle. That's who we, who we were. So, you know, we did everything together and we were involved in events constantly. So just to give you an idea of that kind of mind frame, so to suddenly feel isolated, it's devastating. And you suddenly feel like everyone loved you and then now everyone hates you. And that's the hardest thing. I don't regret it <laughs> because I, you have to be true to yourself. And I, it's like a sacrifice, I suppose, um, to just be honest. And I'd rather be honest. So I don't regret it, but it's, it's painful. <laughs> Any regrets, Sarah? No regrets. No regrets. I think this is exactly where I need to be. I am glad that I got the up upbringing that I did. Mm -hmm. uh, my family was rel relatively liberal in that I was allowed to study overseas at the age of 16, mm -hmm. and I was allowed to live my own life. Um, I That's remember they trusted you. They trusted me. I was. <laughs> I was exactly. I mean, at a, at a very little did they know. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. So when I was. You know, when I was deciding to go overseas, my uncle told my dad, but the Western values, you know, they're, they're very different from our values. And it's always almost the case, even living, I, I was from, I'm, I'm from a developing country, but even in the West, we have, in, even in the West, we have Muslims who have segregated the Islamic value, the Muslim value from the Western value, which just means that they refuse to accept a progressive or a liberal value like a liberal lifestyle, as though they're two separate things. But I am glad I got the upbringing that I did because it's only made me the person that I am, assertive. Um, I like challenging things. And my friends who had known me from university at the age of 18, and now that I'm an ex-Muslim, and they're, they're not Muslims, but they're like, we knew this was coming. You were never really Muslimish because you were always progressive. You talked to everyone. 
So I'm really glad that happened. Any, <laughs> any regrets, Betsy? No, I do not have regrets. So that's, um, I... It works? Ah, okay. <laughs> it does work. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you, if you know that I, I organized in 2009, it was our first action, a picnic during Ramadan. So that's, that's, why, that's why I'm like famous because of this picnic in 2009. And so I think I'm the most hated woman in Morocco. But I'm proud, I'm actually proud. And, uh, I, have, I have to say that we organized this picnic because in Morocco we have an article in the penal, Moroccan Penal Code, it's the article two, um, 222, and it says that, I don't know if I have it, uh, yeah, any, any, per, any person known to be Muslim, but known, we don't, we don't know what known means, but any person known to be Muslim breaking the Ramadan fast publicity, so it's punishable by, uh, by up six months in prison. So we did this demonstration or this action uh, to condemn this article and um, to, to, to fight for um, uh, individual liberty and individu uh, um, freedom of religion and freedom, freedom of conscience. So since 2009, and we are in 2019, and as um, the fact is, I am a woman, so in all religion and Islam in particular, as you said, when you are a woman, so you are not uh, um, permitted to speak or to have like uh, some rights and some, we, we, we cannot exist, I, I think. So, because I organized a lot of things for women's rights, and for um, uh, sexual and re reproductive rights, I organized like a kissing in 2013 because two uh, teenagers, yeah, teenager, yeah, teenager. was yeah was in jail because of a kiss on Facebook. Um, uh, organized a big, big, big uh, action for abortion rights. I organized a lot of actions and the campaign. Um, for um, sexual liberty, for LGBT rights, and um, so I have lots of uh, threats and lots of uh, messages um, and lots of things on social media. Lots of people hate me, and lots of people try to um, how to say um, Stop no, my mom to oh, pressure, 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 yeah. And uh, so I think, yeah, sorry, ma'am, it's very difficult, but, um, but no, I do not have regrets at all. I think uh, we have to fight, we have to fight for our rights, for women's rights, for um, ex-Muslim people and atheist people in general. And um, no, I, I cannot stop my fights. <laughs> I'm going to ask Sadia this question as well, and then we'll open it up to you. Any regrets, Sadia? Well, the first time I met Sadia, actually, was at a CMB event, and all she did was cry. <laughs> I, I don't look at her now. I mean, my gosh, she's like a powerhouse. But she, all she could do was cry, and I didn't even know why she was crying, because it was a very loud room, and all we were doing was hugging each other, but I had no idea what her Nothing's changed. Happened. We still uh, cry. We cry all the time. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> no, it's a rhetorical question. <laughs> no, but I just want to say before I say anything else, actually, like Betty, you are one badass fucking yeah. woman, and we love you. We yeah. do. Oh my god! Like, oh my god! Um, oh my god! <laughs> actually, the, what, what, everything else that we go through, the threats, the shit. Uh, it's actually quite minuscule in comparison to the level of yeah. shit that you deal with. And for us, the the online threats, you know, the on, like dickheads that text us and stuff like that. I'm like, we'll find us first, wanker. <laughs> but with Betty, like that kind of shit, there's only like people only have to whisper in each other's ears. She lives down there, or this like the this, this threat to you. I mean, like, every time I've heard you speak, my heart, just hearing you talk, I'm like, boom, 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 boom. So, like, 
I haven't got a hat on, or maybe I could, no, 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 like, hats off to you, right? Um, and actually, um, and this woman too, she's amazing, like, I know I was supposed to be talking about myself, but... Any regrets? <laughs> she doesn't like being complimented. No, in short, like, and I've been through quite a lot of shit, actually. Like, it's been hard with my family. I've been homeless twice uh, without any support. So financial independence. Like, if you're, uh, if you're kind of on the edge and you're kind of considering leaving family, leaving your community, financial security is key. That's the thing to think about. Um, but, yeah, other than that, no. It's, it's, it's been hard at times. I'm not going to say that it's been easy. But I've never thought I wish I'd stayed in that community and I wish I'd, you know, lived with those same restrictions because um, they were suffocating. Mm -hmm. Well, you've you've heard uh, from all of uh, these brilliant women, and now we want to open it up to you. Uh, we've been speaking for about fifty minutes. We have another twenty minutes uh, to um, uh, get questions and comments from the audience. Uh, while we're getting mics around for people to, uh, if anybody has a question, they can raise their hand uh, and we'll pass the mic around. Uh, Jimmy, do you mind taking mics? In the meanwhile, Summons, Summons, come here, my darling. Uh, so Summons is the uh, brilliant artist uh, whose artwork is outside. Um, and I think it would be nice just to hear a few words from her. Um, I think maybe particularly about some of the issues that were raised here, uh, the, the, the influence of Islamism, and any comments you want to give before we open it up. I, I, uh, hello everyone. Um, actually, um, I'm French as well, <laughs> so English is, not, uh, is my second language. And um, I did prepare a, a speech. I can read it or just... Just yeah. okay. Um, may you want me to to say? Uh, maybe just comment on some of the things oh. you've heard and your opinion on things. Uh, I think it's very important to be uh, to be here and to to um, to be to to say that ex-Muslims, uh, women, uh, which is uh, two uh, two words, very difficult to say for. A lot of people, ex-Muslim is very difficult, but ex-Muslim women, can you imagine? So it's very, uh, it's very important and um, and very uh, ins inspiring, inspiring for for the future. Uh, since today it's very hard uh, to uh, to undergo the social and religious uh, pressure. It's really harder um, and harder today. Um, what I can say that is very hopeful and, and uh, interesting to see, um, even if they are very, they have very different stories. They um, they they share the same the same um, the same experience of uh, the um, patriarchal uh, uh, violences. So uh, patriarchy do exist. This system this system which oppresses. Uh, every woman and also every uh, every child do exist. So there, there are diff different uh, testimonies uh, show that uh, they, 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 they don't know they don't know each other um, before before this event, and they say uh, they say exactly the, the same thing, you know. So their um, their experience is very interesting because we didn't really prepare. What we are supposed to to uh, to say in this conference because we wanted to to be um, spont spontaneous. Um, since since I don't real, really since since I don't speak well uh, English, I, I just uh, uh, prepare a speech because uh, it it was not really scary to to uh, to speak <laughs> to speak today for me. Um, yeah, I finish. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. 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 Um, actually, there's a, a statement by Samens uh, on your tables as well, so you can read about her work as well. Go ahead. Hen. Comment or question or whatever you want to say. Comment and then a question as well. Um, I actually met Mariam 10 years ago. 
It's been 10 years now, and I remember back then there were only few women in the group and any kind of events. And this is amazing that 10 years later we have actually next Muslim women's panel. So fantastic. It's really Whoa. great. Um, so, <laughs> um, so I have a question about um, mothers. So obviously with all of you, I wanted to know how your mums reacted to your coming out story. Obviously in our society, our mothers are sometimes maintaining the patriarchy within the family and within the community as well. They seem to be the ones facing most of the oppression and hatred, more so than our fathers, at least in my you know, experience. So I just wondered how your mothers reacted and how, what relationship you have with them, if any, I hope. Thank you. I think just feel free to respond. Um, I just recently put up a video, I hate the camera, but I just recently put up a video on family and boundaries. So surprisingly, my family and I actually have a working relationship. It's not the best, we've had safe distances, but especially with my mum. I'm not sure if she's in an illusion that this is a phase, but we communicate. Um, she feels for me, she loves me a lot. Um, she tries sending me this Islamic forwards, like, you'll come back, you'll come back, one day you will. And I had to stop there and I'm like, if you send me one more forward, I'm going to block you. Because this is not nice for me. Just the same way, I'm not going to send bacon to your house. Right? So we had to, we had to maintain safe distances. And there's, and you know, I put a roadmap up on how people can come out. But just maintaining distances is actually improving our relationship. And, you know, just me talking about my mental health, which I'm very open about, it's, it's helping us connect even more. And she respects me more now that I've had more resistance to all the hate and all the emotional blackmail from my family and my cousins and everybody else. I think my family respects me more now than they ever have before. Um, with me, my mum is kind of along with the rest of my family as I said they're kind of like moving like a flock of people so they kind of they, they have like had meetings about this about me um so and you're right about the whole women thing you know it's it's basically like all the women cousins and my aunties and my mum have like come together to like figure out what's wrong with me um and with me my mum in particular is kind of more like oh, there's something wrong, like it's, it's like she's just sad, you know, it's more kind of like, there's something wrong with you and we'll fix you, like, it, you know, I'm, she's kind of like hopeful that I'll be fixed one day. Um, but again, I kind of would rather that than her kind of wanting to kill me, obviously some people have it way worse, so, um, but obviously, ideally, I'd, I'd rather just accept me for who I am, but um, you can't have it all. The bar's really low, isn't it? I'm really glad they don't want to kill me. I'm just glad they accept me because yeah. they don't want to kill me. Yeah. At least they're talking to me. I mean, that's the reality, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah as I say, I, I really want to take my mom and I don't want to cry but because it's very, very hard. I'm sorry that I cannot explain and express myself uh, in English because um, I like when I organized the picnic in 2009, so I was I was a woman like other women, but because of this picnic, I was like uh, very famous, but in in the bad um, side. So in uh, in all the world, all newspapers, etc. But since 2009, it was because I never stop and I do a lot of things, and it's very very hard. Uh, for my man, he, she lives in Morocco. I live in Morocco and France, so I, I'm, I'm uh, very often in, in Morocco as well. So it's um, she's she, she's Muslim, but she's secular. She she met my my dad, and my dad was activist, was agnostic, was in jail because his activism. He died in 2008, and I co-founded my movement in 2009. So it's like okay, so. Your, your dad is not there anymore and you, you are doing the same thing. <laughs> so, but she's cool, but it's very difficult because lots of people and society and family are like, so what's wrong with, what's wrong with what, your daughter? And uh, you have to, to tell her to stop this, uh, these things, etc. So I, I want to thank um, her tonight because she's very patient. Yeah and uh, she's still uh, supporting me and, uh, 
and uh, she's very, very um, liberal and very cool because I'm um, like every day when I saw her, I'm like blaspheming, <laughs> and so she's cool with that. And I'm like, okay, you have to tell these people that um, Islam is like misogynist, misogynistic, yeah, religion, and we don't yet we don't have equality. We have like we live in gender upper, apartheid. And I want to give one example because I forgot. Well, like when I was uh, very young, I, I was like, okay, I never. Um, knew that when you have the bat baptism, bat 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 baptism, yeah, that you have uh, ships. Yeah, with it, uh, no, what's the name of the? Comment dit mouton? Yeah, ships. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, when you have uh, baptism for children, yeah, you have two ships when it's a boy and one ship when it's a girl. Ship, 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 so I forgot to, to tell this story because I was like, what? I, 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 I never knew. That. No, uh, no, no, never. But so. So that's why I'm trying to explain to my mom because I don't want to to uh, face this, this, this to face these people. So I gave her a lot of example and I told I asked her to tell these people and uh, she 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 does. So thank to my mom and uh, it's cool with her the relationship. It's uh, very cool. Also, sorry, I think you mentioned it as well. Just that there's this. With, the, with mums, and I've heard this other women say this as well, where they almost ignore the fact sometimes, they kind of go into this like delusional thing where they'll just be like, oh, did you pray? Or like, or like my mum would be like, okay, we'll just make a little dua, and I'm like, no, I don't do that anymore, remember? Um, so it's like, yeah, that happens a lot, I've heard as well. <laughs> yeah, it's like whenever I uh, travel, because my parents live in the States, you know how when you're traveling, you have to walk under the Quran? And my dad keeps my dad keeps putting the Quran out to me and I'm like, Dad, just get this thing off my own. But the plane will most probably crash if I have to walk under the Quran. But it is this thing where they constantly just pretend to, you know, everything's fine. Uh, but I think Halima raised a really important point, which is this the shunning of the family, this deep love and need to be loved by your family. And it's so painful. I can see uh, expressions when we even talk about it, how, uh, how heartbreaking it can be for so many people. And I just want to tell you one thing uh, that I've, um, I, when I was in Holland at an event, I met this uh, wonderful uh, Dutch Turkish woman. Her name is Nazmia Oral. And she has a hijabi mother. She herself is an atheist. And uh, she's done a film with her hijabi mother. She actually goes on tour. They perform together. And they relive all the stuff that the mother's told her and all the things that she's told the mom. And it's what she says is, I demand to be loved the way that I am. I refuse to let you shun me. And I, I don't know, when I heard this, I was hysterical crying. And I had to give my speech after she spoke. I was like, I have to speak after her. I, I can't speak anymore. I don't know, it just really hits an emotional chord, you know. And this is one of the things that people just keep going back to abusive relations. They're trying, they, they pretend they're still, no matter what, they're still trying to fit into a box to, to have that love. And, and that is, I think, one of the most difficult things. Anyway, another question or comment? Uh, I have a question from somebody who wants to remain anonymous and doesn't want their voice on the sure. recording. Uh, the question is directed towards Zara. Uh, so in the UK, often we see that there's maybe like well-known human rights organizations and the media won't take up the voice of ex-Muslims and they won't take up the dialogue of uh, apostasy because of the need to stay politically correct. And the question was whether that's the same in Australia or whether it's different. Absolutely, it's very much the same and even more so because we don't have a lot of ex-Muslim people talking out. We don't have a big organization like CMB that are public. We have an underground Australian ex-Muslim group, but most of the people there are undercover. But yes, there is very much so the regressive left and the right who prey on the vulnerable. 
And no, we, they don't give us an opportunity. I was in the media on, like, I was in the media earlier this year after Rahaf's case, like, talking about Faithless Jabi. And, you know, I just submitted a paper, like, three months ago um, about why apostasy laws won't stop the rise of ex Muslim women. And it talked about honor killing, it talked about apostasy laws in 13 countries and why women face the harshest. Um, treatment in Islam and even when we come out and since Christchurch they're like I don't think we're going to publish it so you know it's just it's just given us a lot of backlash and yeah in Australia it's very much the same the left the left won't let us talk I've been like I said I've been called racist um, after Christchurch all of us got the you know the regressive left even even the rights were kind of scrutinizing us and it's yeah very much the same in Australia or even worse because we don't have big organizations vouching for our free speech that's the annoying thing is we get it from every every side the Muslim yeah, yeah. left yeah. 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 Right. and yeah. every yeah. country the left the right we, we just we just have our own island and i think that's what makes us that was that's what makes our small voices even louder and powerful and that shouldn't stop any of us. No attack should stop us from free speech, especially against all hate and discrimination. But it was the same with these events. Uh, we, have, we have another six minutes. Uh, 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 any other? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, uh, Mimsy, you mentioned that you were visited by a shape, and he told you that you were being uh, infested or infected by magic. Presumably not the Harry Potter kind. Um, we know that some families seek out exorcisms to treat people who are struggling with their mental illness. I volunteer with a mental health charity called Time to Change. One of my objectives is to defeat the stigma around talking about mental health in all contexts, not just ours. I want to know how, your advice on how to help vulnerable people seek real treatment instead of seeking out exorcisms whether it's through their choice or through their family's choices. Yeah, I mean, I didn't hear the, the end of that, just, but, but, yeah, but I mean, what we're all doing, I think, is, is part of that, because at the end of the day, you know, the, 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 this concept of religion, where does that come from? It comes from, well, in this particular instance with that sheikh, you know, he's talking from the Quran, you know, this is an illness that the Prophet spoke about. Um, and so these are issues that we all are kind of discussing as ex-Muslims and basically telling everyone that this is all nonsense. But you're absolutely right, this is something that really needs to be discussed so much more because mental illness and then blaming it on an exorcism is so dangerous. Um, and then, you know, so many people are prevented from taking medication and it's, it's just, I, I, mean, I, I don't know if you guys have any points on that, but it's... Yeah, so, um, just, a, um, there's an organisation called the National FGM Centre um, and they've broadened their horizons just from FGM recently to <laughs> breast dining, but also um, religious based harmful traditional practices so it is being picked up it's still very very quiet but it is being picked up so there is help and support out there because now religious based abuse is being considered a harmful traditional practice so it's worth noting that thank you should we get should we get uh, three more questions and then we'll do a final roundup of answers just so we can get as many people in as possible and then you go ahead here uh, hi um so I have two questions, and uh, so I recently wrote an article about ex-Muslims uh, in my university blog, and the most common uh, reaction I got was, uh, what about Islamophobia? Um, so uh, it was almost as if uh, the ex-Muslim issue was uh, treated, was being treated as like a collateral damage. So like, yeah, they get killed and get abused by their, their families, but you know, we have to protect our Muslims first. So how do you change uh, the kind of perception? And uh, second question is, is uh, I'm wondering if you have any, have had any uh, success talking to Muslims? Because I have a lot of Muslim friends and uh, actually one of my best friends in, in uni used to be uh, Muslim and he was very progress, progressive Muslim, but he was still very uh, defensive and uh, sensitive about uh, is the, the criticism of Islam. And, when I, when I tried to talk to him about the, the issues in Islam, like the wife beating, um, it went kind of 
uh, really bad, and uh, now he thinks that I'm uh, brainwashed by Jews or something. So, so how, how, how do you? <laughs> So, so, how, 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 so, if you have any tips, uh, can I just say? You. Can we just sorry? Let's yes. get because there's only four minutes. Let's get a few questions and then we'll all round up. Uh, uh, how can yes. you claim to be Muslim when you were never ex-Muslim when you were never Muslim anyway? Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think a suggestion for a way forward, and I think being old enough to be everybody's dad out there. I can, you know, I can say that. I, I'll, I'll take on Mariam, Mariam in that being the biggest badass here of all. In that, Mariam, Mariam, you belong to me. Before you jump on me saying it's misogynistic and, and patriarchal, you belong to me because every fiber in my body, as a surgeon I only know biology, you lot are much cleverer, Every fiber, every cell in my body resonates with every cell and every fiber in your body. Now, these are very brave young women out there, but still the pain and poignance is coming out of losing their families. Ladies, please be aware that all of us are your family. And you are our family. And we need to reach out to each other to fill that horrific, painful void that all of us feel having ditched Islam. A very quick uh, second point to me about, about a speaker who said about mothers. Now, to my transition, leaving Islam was very easy compared to yours. It's either before, uh, life is two periods, before you read Russell and after you read Russell. Thankfully for me, it happened. <laughs> I'm between 13 and 14, because there was no TV, etc. Now, <laughs> Russell, Russell wrote that the biggest prejudices are created at your mother's knees. Mm -hmm. You read Russell and you read a bit of Quran and realize, God, oh, load of nonsense that is, and you convert. I mean, it's, 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 it's impossible not to. Now, some of you are going to be mothers, and the reason I'm here to support you is that you will be far more effective. I don't have those organs, but you do, and you will be far more effective in actually bringing up your children than dads like me could ever be. So thank you, and you, as a family, as a dad to all of you, have my total support. Yeah, thank, thank you for making us all cry. Yeah, because, you know, it, it has to happen, doesn't it? Yeah. Guys, we really have no more time. Yeah, go on, my darling, last one. Yeah. Action oriented question. Um, uh, the word Islamophobia has been manufactured by the British Rhino for a long time back and it has been categorically and systematically disseminated into the media as everywhere else. Every time something happens, this word comes back uh, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, an, uh, as a resistance to any criticism of Islam or uh, its ill effects on, uh, on, on the society anywhere in the world. Can we do to counter that? What can we do something similar to counter that? Okay, thank you very much. So uh, let's finish now. Um, if you can each uh, just uh, comment. Can start? No, Betsy can't talk. No. Okay. 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 Let's just take turns uh, and just uh, answer okay. any question or make any final comments. Okay. Comments. Just I'll just say very quickly. Um, the the term Islamophobia just needs to be scratched. If you hear this term, it, it's just a ridiculous term that doesn't make any sense. It's basically putting together, um, you know, attacking Muslim people and an ideology, which doesn't make sense. What we're criticizing is an idea, is an ideology, you know, and there should be no reason why we can't do that. It's done in every other circumstance. And there's this special treatment that infuriates me about, you know, and they kind of make it as if it's racist or we're attacking a people. It's like, no, that's not 
not the case, that's not what we're doing. Um, so scratch this term, I don't even like hearing it. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about the idea that I just wanted to say. Yeah. So we've heard this term Islamophobia for such a long time, but all it does is shut conversations up that can challenge Islam. And I will always challenge an ideology that doesn't give women their rights, that subjugates them, that wants to kill me and people like me, but I will not stand for anti-Muslim bigotry. I will stand against that. And I always make a distinction when I talk about Islam that does not equal to Muslims. I will continue to scrutinize that ideology. <laughs> So um, in terms of this defensiveness that you've come up against from your friends when you talk about um, ideas within Islam, actually we find that quite early on with a lot of ex-Muslims as well. It's very, very uncomfortable. That defensiveness has been drilled into us from a very, very young age. So even after leaving Islam, some of that defensiveness remains. That's quite normal. That's part of a process. So we tend not to be, well, I tend not to try and get too in people's faces because they're on their own little journey. Um, but healthy conversation is useful. Um, and, and you know, you can't blame them for that defensiveness. I do want to touch on the first question you asked actually, because I get fed up of talking about uh, and safeguarding the fuckers that want me dead. And the fuckers that want us dead. Right? So, ex-Muslim women get a lot of shit, right? And those that are popularizing this definition of Islamophobia tend to be quite radical uh, Islamist type individuals. So why should I have to worry about safeguarding them? By talking about my issues, I'm, th there is no suggestion that by proxy I want them dead, or I want some harm to come to them. That is often thrown at us intentionally to prevent us from talking about it. And the only other um, situation where I saw a likeness of that was the, the grooming gangs, right? So for, for years, the young girls that were being systematically raped and rounded up by these fucking paedophiles, we didn't talk about the perpetrators because we were too scared about the backlash on the perpetrators. Well, I am sick of talking about, about the, the safety of the perpetrators. Fuck the perpetrators. I, I want to thank all of you um, and thank these wonderful, brilliant women here. Uh, one final sentence from each of them. Uh, what is the best thing that has happened to you since you've left Islam? Betsy. <laughs> the best thing. What? Yeah, no, yeah. but I like it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Betsy. Yeah, that's what I don't know. The best thing. Uh, the best thing, like, I, I am free. I'm a free woman. It's the best, best, best thing, I think. Yeah. I'm really free. I mean, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's it. You're, you're, you're free to, to believe what you want, to do what you want. You don't have to double check a kind of old book if, if it's okay. I mean, other than that, that's the main thing. Yeah. Um, I actually have a tattoo that says free. Okay. That's exactly it. I think it's free. Yeah. Yeah. This, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you. And thank you uh, for your kind words, for your support. We need to support each other.